Aloha, everybody. Aloha. What's up? What's up, you say? I'll tell you what's up. We have a very special guest speaker, and uh, Brian Wood is no stranger to any of us. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, he has uh, ministered with his family in this community for so many years. And so to be here in a church service in San Juan Capistrano, uh, after watching their life and their previous mission experiences and their current mission uh, journey as missionaries, I know that you're going to be blessed and we're going to be greatly encouraged. Would you give a warm Calvary South County slash Coach House welcome to Pastor Brian as he comes up and delivers the message? Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. I'm going to be talking about anxiety. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully I'm going to be talking about how to overcome anxiety, not just about anxiety. Oh, I'm supposed to stay in front of this. I'm going to remember it. <laughs> anyway, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is speaking here, and he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. There's my message. Uh, that's the summary of it. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? We're going to answer that question. I'm going to ask you, ready? You got to answer after I say it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Yes. 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 All right. Look at the birds in the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Ready to answer the question? Are you not more valuable than birds? Yes. yes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we're more valuable than birds. We thank you that you care about every single person that's here this morning. And we thank you that every single person here that knows you is a daughter or a son of the King of Kings. We thank you for the place we hold in your heart. We thank you for the place we hold in your eyes. And we thank you that you care about each one of us. We thank you that you are on the throne and will never move. In November, you're going to be on the throne. In December, in January, you'll still be on the throne. The king of our kingdom. And so we thank you for that. And we pray that if anyone has any anxiety here, Lord, you would break that free this morning. We pray also that we use this message to help those in the community and those around us who are anxious or worried or troubled by this time that we would be those ministers, those ambassadors of you to bring peace. We just pray a blessing upon this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to be talking about freedom from anxiety, so I'm going to tell you about Mozambique. And so I'll give you a rundown on Mozambique. As soon as you hear about Mozambique, you're going to think, man, I have it made. And I want you to know that no matter what you're going through right now, I'm pretty sure you have it better. And so often... And this is, might sound wrong, I don't know, maybe not, but sometimes it's good to think about, it could be worse. I mean, there is somebody that has it worse. I mean, there is one guy in the whole world that has it worse than anybody else, but, but it's probably not you. There's somebody that has it worse. So when I tell you about Mozambique, every time I think about Mozambique, I think about, man, I am so blessed <laughs> to be in America right now. I am so blessed by all the things going on. Mozambique, we lived there, as most of you know, we lived there for nine years, and we've been ministering um, through our teams there for 12 years. And we have uh, seen them just do some amazing things. But over the last uh, few months, they actually didn't close their churches till uh, April. So we were able to continue doing seminars. Uh, we have um, five teams. Um, now we had four, now we have five actually. Teams that minister and do seminars to train the pastors and disciple the churches. We're working with over a couple thousand churches still in Mozambique. And so 
We've been sending them out to do seminars, to teach our discipleship books, and it was going fantastic all the way till April when they closed everything down. Uh, we, at the time, were in Thailand. I'm sorry, Indonesia. We've been in Asia. Um, we went from Africa to we are now in Asia. Asia, compared to Africa, is a vacation. Mm -hmm. You know, we are missionaries in Asia, and it is... I don't, I don't know any other word to describe it than wonderful or vacation compared to Africa. So in April, um, they basically did what most of the world has done. They shut down all the churches. And until this day, they have so many strict regulations even to open the churches. It, it is pretty incredible. If you want to have a church now in Mozambique, you have to follow, is it 35? 35 rules from the government which have restricted the church so much. We have churches where their offerings are maybe $5 a week. That is, the people are subsistence farmers. They don't have any money, and yet they have to have, if they want to open church, they have to go to the government and show them their thermometer that can read the temperature on their forehead. And they have to keep batteries in it, which they probably can't, pretty much the offering would be two batteries. Uh, so they've got to have that. They've got to have a washing station. They've got to have monitors. They've got to fill out forms. It, they've made it really difficult for the people to meet. So the church has been going through its difficulties, but at least we've had a foundation. We've been able to teach them. But then in northern Mozambique for the last few years, it's just been horrendous. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in Mozambique, there are 10 provinces. The northern one is called Cabo Delgado. Cabo Delgado may be the richest piece of land in all the world. It might be. It has the uh, third largest natural gas field in the entire world. I mean, we're talking about Alaska is maybe ahead of them, but they have the third largest. They have two of the largest oil fields in all the world. They have the largest ruby mine in the entire world. This place is rich. It has gems and it has oil and it has natural gas and it is poor as can be. If you go to a school in Cabo Delgado and run by the government and you go in there, they do not have desks or chairs. They sit on benches or rocks. The teachers have absolutely nothing. There are no jobs. The people are completely poor. And so you have this situation in this area where over half a billion dollars has come into Cabo Delgado, and not a dime has gone to the people. Now, this does not create a happy environment. They see all this money. I went to Pimba. Last time I was in Pimba, there were 10 of these giant uh, you know, helicopters that hold like 10 or 12 executives. So there's 10 of them at the airport. They're all by the oil fields and the oil developers and Halliburton and people from France and people from Brazil coming in there to develop their land and bringing in millions and millions of dollars and none of it goes to the people. Well, the people are upset, as you can imagine. They have no jobs. Their kids are not being educated. The government is not helping in them in any way. Everywhere they turn, the government takes advantage of them. Now, I, I, it, it's so hard to imagine. People always go, well, we're getting the same kind of corruption in America. No, you're not. <laughs> you cannot go from first grade to second grade or second grade to third grade without paying your teacher. You have to pay a bribe to your teacher to go to the next grade. If you get good grades, it's a little bribe. If you get bad grades, it's a bigger bribe. You go to the hospital, and I'm not exaggerating this, you go to the hospital, the nurse will not talk to you until you give her some money. She's getting a salary, the doctor will not talk to you unless you give him some money. You cannot do anything without a bribe or some kind of a graft. And you gotta imagine, this is creating a little bit of anger when they see some of these you know, government officials drive up in their brand new SUV and they have nothing. So then a group from um, basically the same people who were ISIS, it's not ISIS, it's Islamic State of what is Iran and Syria, so it's not ISIS anymore, it's IS, the Islamic State, they come in to work because all of northern Mozambique is Muslim. And so they have a couple of different tribes. One of the tribes, uh, the Kemwani, have always been very strict Muslims. They came in and said, we can 
break you free from the government and all this oil money will be yours. We'll be able to control this. You'll have riches. It'll be fantastic. All you have to do is take our guns, overthrow the government, and it is going to be fantastic. Now, the two tribes up there are both Muslims. The Kimwani and the, the Ma Mandi. They're, Makondi. Makondi. They're both Muslim groups, and yet they don't like each other. So the one Muslim group is basically killing off the other Muslim group. Now they've got guns, they're killing off the other group. So instead of really attacking the government, they're killing the other <coughs> tribe, which are the same poor people who are being taken advantage of by the government. But they're also attempting to overthrow the government. The largest port up there, Simba de Praia, they've taken over four times in fights back and forth. There, there are an estimated, in that area, 300,000 people. 250,000 of them have fled. So 200,000 have fled down to the main city in, that, uh, in Cabo Delgado, which is Pimba. That's where my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are working, and many of the uh, nonprofit organizations have come to help them. Another 50,000, because they've overrun Pimba, have gone down to the next province down below called Nampula, and 50,000 refugees are there. Those are the people that we are helping. We have uh, pastors there, one of our... A key pastor who has a truck and, and has been ministry for us. He is down in that area, and we are trying to help 50,000 refugees, which of course we can't. We, can't, we don't have the resources to help 50,000 people who have arrived with nothing. They didn't come with any extra clothes. They didn't come with any extra food. And if they had any money, which was probably very little, they probably spent it just to get down there. The government has given them land which the, there's plenty of land in Africa. I don't know if you've ever flown over Africa. It's empty. If you've ever worried about overpopulation, just go to Africa. <laughs> you, can drive, you can drive in Africa for five days and not see a single... I mean, it's amazing. The whole place is open. They gave them all land, but they didn't even give them a hoe or seed. I mean, here's the land. I'm gonna, I mean, I don't know how to grow anything. I have no green thumb here. This, I, I can't grow. And these guys got to go from dirt. So we have been, one of the main things that we do besides giving uh, food, uh, we have been giving um, hoes, they're called inshadas, so they can actually uh, start hoeing uh, the field and planting. Um, hopefully we can work maybe on seeds and hopefully the government will get it together and give them seeds. But we've been able to give them food. Um, because they came with nothing, we had to give them buckets to get water. Uh, we had to give them pans to get food. And so it, it's just been amazing how people have responded. We, we spoke to two. This is my first church in person I've spoken to since March. So if I get a little excited, you'll see. They're going to have a hard time dragging me away from here because I'm kind of excited. Talking to real people. I've been talking to a little green dot. It's just not that exciting talking to a green dot. In fact, I have a conference. We have a conference this week. Um, it'll start Tuesday morning, which means Monday tomorrow at 7 o'clock from 7 to 10. I'll be preaching in Thailand to a little green dot on Zoom. And it's just hard to get excited about that group, you know. I could try to look for a happy face or somebody nodding, you know, and not nodding off. But it's hard on that little screen. So it's kind of nice to be here in front of people. And so it is so great to be here to be able to preach in front of people. Um, so that's exciting. But we've been doing uh, Zoom things, but we have seen uh, just an amazing uh, impact that I know, I know it's tragic and... Uh, in some of the stories, if I told you, I'm, I don't repeat some of the stories because they're so horrific of what those people have experienced that have fled there. They have basically uh, wiped out uh, big chunks of uh, uh, people in cities, women, children, men. Uh, it, it has been horrible, horrific. The people that have fled to Nampula now, they are Muslims, but they are so open to the gospel. I mean, there's something about trauma and your whole life being turned upside down and we have been able to go down there and because there are no other groups that we've heard of that are giving any relief to these people uh, the team that we have has been going in there and giving food out and giving supplies and they have received incredible favor from the government and at first they were going to be able to show the Jesus film in Makandi. We got the Jesus film in Makandi. We uh, got tires for the pastor down there because he, he had a truck, but it had five of the tires were showing the steel belts. 
You know, you have, you've seen that with all, all this deal. And he showed us one flat, and he's putting on a spare, and that spare looked like that thing should have been thrown away three years ago. And they've been using it. And we, we, we were able to get, we pulled some people about it. We got six tires. Um, I spoke at two little home groups. We got um, $11,500 $11, to send just from two little home groups. And people have been very responsive uh, to the need there. And so now they're showing the Jesus film at night. They have the truck. We got them that. We got them projectors. We had done this before. We got all of our seminar teachers projectors to show the Jesus film. You can now get a projector on Amazon for $88 that shows great at night on a sheet. And you can actually put the micro SD chip right into the video player. So all, you know, all they need is a little local sound system and they've been, they've been going. And we had bought uh, the one pastor, Pastor Don Wickey, we had bought him a, uh, uh, a generator, a Honda generator. 11, 11 years ago, we bought him that generator, but it's Honda. And he, he did, but they didn't have the parts to fix it. And they just got it fixed and they've been showing the Jesus film. And the government said, don't worry about masks. Don't worry about social distancing. This movie is great. Let's just show this to everybody. Yeah. And you can, we got pictures. Where they're just all together. They're all watching the Jesus film. They're very receptive uh, to the gospel. So in the midst of tragedy, God is still working. Um, if these people that have been had such hardship before, it's worse. But if they can know Jesus and enjoy paradise forever, it's going to be a, a wonderful and awesome thing. Um, so as we talk about uh, anxiety and worry, compared to the people of Cabo Delgado, you guys have got it made. <laughs> I've got it made. We, are, we, are, we have food, we have clothes, we don't have to worry about that. And it is such a blessing to be here in the States. And, and everybody has been such a blessing to, even from this church, a couple people have really stepped up and helped uh, to send some funds uh, over to uh, Mozambique. And it's been uh, a real blessing. We, for the last uh, year, have been in Asia. We were having a blast in Asia, by the way. Uh, Asia is so nice. So, we're in Africa. Africa, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It, it actually changed my life. I went from being a happy-go-lucky guy to being kind of anxious and, and worried about things. I actually, It actually did change me. I'm going to talk about that as I talk about anxiety. But then we got to go, after all that time in Africa, we went to Asia. Now in Asia, we're in the second largest city in, in Thailand, uh, Chiang Mai. And so the cheapest place to live is a one bedroom condo, which we rented, I think it was $300 a month. We got a one bedroom condo. It had a pool. <laughs> now, if you've been in Africa for nine years and you're, you're lucky to find mud, you, it is so awesome to be, we went to church one day, we had a great morning, there were, people got saved, people got healed. We were, we're sitting by the pool thinking, this is not missionary life. <laughs> this is so wonderful. And we could go downstairs. Our, our, our condo didn't have a kitchen. There's no stove or anything in, our, in it because nobody cooks in Thailand because the restaurants are $2. All the Thai food you want for two bucks a meal. So we were very happy in Thailand. And then we went to Indonesia. It was very similar. Actually, somebody gave us free housing. We were having a great time. And then the government said, everyone without a permanent residence visa must leave the country. Uh, that was in March. And so since then, we've been doing everything online and by Zoom and attempting to still serve the Lord through. And amazing, we actually kept incredibly busy, but we were having a wonderful time. Um, maybe I'll share a little bit more as I go on my sermon. Now that I've given you an update, I've probably got 10 more minutes left for my sermon. So, <laughs> Real quick, any questions about ministry in Mozambique, Thailand, online, Zoom? I'm going for questions and answers. Before yeah. I... Yes. We have the film cell in all 1,800 languages. Yes. And I have to ask my father, I'm going to give you Oh, oh wonderful. And you can pull it down on your phone. Any, any other thing. It's amazing. We, we love the, the, the Jesus film. We have showed the Jesus film in an amazing amount of languages. And we have shown the African follow-up. Uh, they are fantastic. They're all Africans talking, you know, and talking about the one chief guy gets saved who's got two wives. And the whole thing is really fantastic. Amazing ministry. It is, it is amazing how that has impacted so many lives. And I always, some of the people shut it off before the end of the Jesus film, but the end of it always presents the gospel in an incredible way. So I always show it all the way to the end. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I was telling the gals over there that, um, 
you can go to your app store and get the Jesus Film app store, and uh, you know, like I did in the old days when I had my nails done, um, all the Vietnamese gals all signed in their language and they came back and they just couldn't believe that they could hear the whole thing in their own language. So there's, like she said, 1,800 languages now. It, it is and fantastic. So just go to your app store, your app on your phone, and get your kids to do it. And uh, <laughs> it's right there. We've given it out on micro SD cards, and they can stick them in their phone and watch the whole Jesus film on their phone. Um, amazing, amazing ministry. And uh, yeah, we, we attempted to show that almost every weekend while we were in Mozambique. It was a wonderful thing. Yes? They can watch it on their phone without, a, without an SD card. Yes, if they have internet. Yeah, they just, they have to actually pay for those megabytes, which nobody has any money. <laughs> but if I get, well, they're, in Mozambique, you prepay for things. You, you pay an amount of money and you get 10 megabytes. Does that make sense? You don't have a contract you do every month. Nobody has any money. So this is very interesting. For 10 um, of the money in Mozambique, it doesn't matter what it is to you guys, but which is equivalent to 12 cents. For 12 cents, you can have 100 megabytes for an hour. But after the hour, it expires. So our kids, we had no internet, and they want to download a game that is 21 gigabytes. I know I'm not talking to the most tech-savvy group. I can just tell by the age, because you're at my age, and you, we don't know that stuff. 21 gigabyte, right? They've got to enter a code to put it in to get 100 for an hour. They would stay up all night putting in codes, trying to download a game that they wanted from the internet. Anyway. Any other questions? I just totally got off track there. Something that was totally not related to anything. Yes. Anything? Anybody? All right. We're in Matthew chapter 6. It says, Therefore, do not worry about your life. God doesn't want us to worry. In fact, it, it is actually in the imperative mode. That means it's a command. Don't worry. Be happy. I, I love that song, by the way. It's one of my favorites. Besides the hymns, I love the Don't Worry, Be Happy song. There's the same word is used in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. So don't worry about your life. Don't be anxious about anything. And they are both commands. Now, it's pretty hard to command somebody not to be anxious. I mean, you, 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 I don't know how many of you experience anxiety. I'm not going to have you raise your hands. Some people are actually embarrassed to say, I actually experience anxiety. Did you know that 15% of Americans suffer from anxiety that can disable them from many things and it is almost all chemical? I don't know if you knew that. Uh, it's just something in the brain that happens. I have, in my whole life, I never experienced that. You can talk to the experts on my life, that's my wife and my kids. You tell them, I am very, nothing really phases me. I'm very easygoing and nothing bothers me. And I sleep as long as I want anytime I put my head on a pillow. I just did not experience anxiety. I had no empathy whatsoever for people who were anxious because I had never experienced I could just pray. Pray and give thanks and you'll be fine. Then I went to Africa for nine years. And some of you know my story. I mean, you, you, how many of you heard the time that we got robbed at gunpoint? How many have heard that story? Some of you heard that story. I'm gonna give the real <laughs> short version of that. We were at home at night in our house. I'm in my room on my typewriter with my headphones on and I hear a bunch of noise. Somebody had, this group, had taken a steel bar, stuck it in our steel gate over our front door, all three of them pulled on the bar and pulled concrete out of the wall. Broke into our house with guns and machetes. They slapped my son's face with a machete. Uh, Matthew, he, I think he was about maybe 12 or 13. They put a gun to Matt's head and they put a gun to Nate's head, my son's. My other son, Caleb, he ran into the bathroom and hid under a tarp. We were remodeling one of the two bathrooms. We actually that. The house was new, we hadn't finished it yet. We haven't even finished it. And I said, Caleb, you were the smartest one, always do that. <laughs> he, I think he was what, maybe like seven or eight years old and he's under a tarp the whole time. I don't know which one traumatically would have infected them more, but it definitely affected them um, 
it was uh, the longest probably 10 minutes uh, of my life. Uh, it, it was very traumatic. Our kids had nightmares. I want you to know to this day, this is true, I go to, I go to bed fully dressed. Well, shorts and a t-shirt. But, you know, after you hear these stories of other missionaries and people have broken into your house at night, you're, oh, it, it changes you. Something in your thinking goes, hmm, I better at least have shorts on. <laughs> I mean, I, that, that's what I'm thinking. And, and, and so things like trauma and difficulty can change your perspective on life and change something within you. Now, that one didn't change me all that much. It did our kids. I remember Nate would wake up screaming at night. So it did have an impact on them. Um, and, I, and I've always told this story. It had a real impact on Matthew, our son. And, and, I, and I'll never forget that just the, the way he grew from that. Because uh, God works everything together for good, for me and for my kids. And... I remember when they uh, rescued us and they flew us to Pimba, uh, my sister-in-law did. Um, they hired a, a plane from uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship to fly us out of there. And then right after they flew us out, another gang came in, because they must have heard about the booty at our house, you know, and, and, and put another guard in the hospital. And what they didn't destroy, they stole. And so we were back in Pimba, and, and, on, and there was this big evangelist guy that was there that came and gave Matt a big hug. He's about this tall. Uh, his name's Duncan. Anyway, he, he said, I'm, I'm so envious of you, Matthew. And I, maybe I shared this before. He goes, I just, I just wish I was you. And I remember Matthew looking at him like, well, what is he talking about? He goes, you know, you're one in a million. You know, it's probably one in a million Westerners who have suffered for Jesus, who have suffered for the gospel. And I could see him kind of... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I remember when my sister always said, hey, well, we're gonna, probably going to put you in charge of all of uh, central Mozambique at, at this one base called Donda. We're going to put you in charge of that. And it was actually quite a, an expansion of our ministry. And, and I remember Matthew, and, and if I've told you this, I'm sorry, but Matthew said, we can't do it. We can't go. And Heidi said, my sister in law said, oh, Matthew, what? That's, of course, uh, his aunt, because uh, my sister-in-law, she goes, Matthew, how come you don't want to go to Dondo? It's a bigger ministry opportunity. There's lots there. It's safer. The, the, the base is near the police station. And he goes, well, I read a lot of books on war. And every time someone starts to retreat, they lose. And we can't retreat. And I was just like so proud of him. That's Matthew. <laughs> that little kid. He's like he's growing, and and through that whole experience, I, I just watched how Matthew grew. Um, somebody told us that the Lord's going to give you seven times what you lost in that, and then somebody else said, the "Lord's going to give you ten times." Ten times was way low. <laughs> we were so blessed by so much that came in after that that it, it was amazing. But anyway, that had an impact, negative and positive. That was not as traumatic. That didn't change my heart as much as the time I was arrested and put in jail. Did you know I, I had actually been in jail? I served eight hours. <laughs> now, this was the longest eight hours of my life ever. Uh, eight hours. That's not very long, but it, it was very traumatic. Now, I've got to give you a little background. One of our employees in that town had been thrown in jail and when they threw him in jail, he was sexually molested by all the inmates. So I'm going to jail for eight hours. I'm, I only think I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm not thinking Jesus is on the throne. I love him. And I'm thinking, that guy was put in there. And I said to the, the, the warden, I guess you call him, I said, um, I got thrown in, in jail because of corrupt policemen who wanted to bribe and stuff like that. But that, that's a different story. On a Friday of a four-day weekend, so there was no judge to see for four days. Another story, I know another missionary who had served seven days in jail, and his, his story was horrific. So I've got all these stories running in my mind, right? And I'm offering the, the uh, warden, whatever you want to call him, can I get you a refresh go and sit out here till we figure this out, you know, in the outer room? Because he wants me to take my shoelaces off and go into the other room, you know, where all the prisoners are. And uh, actually, I didn't say it. My, my friend that was with me said it to him. And uh, so I was able to, oh, by the way, when you say, do you want to 
refreshco, you want to drink, it means kind of give me some money to sit out here and not go in there. So I, I must admit I did pay something to sit outside there until we figured this out. But I sat there on a four day weekend and sat there for eight hours trying to get this resolved. And, and it was, I was like sweating bullets. I'm thinking, I don't want to go back in that room. I heard the story about the other guy. I don't want to go back there. I'm going to stay right here. It's a Friday and there's no judge to see. And how can we resolve that? And that eight hours changed my life. I do not sleep like I used to. It was a combination of different things, but that was probably the most traumatic. I want you to know that when I go to sleep now, it's very hard for me to sleep. I, I've since fixed that and found ways to fix it. That's why I want to give this sermon about how to overcome anxiety. I wake up at four or five in the morning now, and I just have things spinning in my mind. I don't know how many of you have that, but some of you who have experienced anxiety have that. You know that there's just this, there's stupid little problems that just come up at four o'clock in the morning and they will not go. They just run in my mind like a reel. <laughs> I've tried the uh, Philippians 4, 6, where it says, pray about everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds, right? In Christ Jesus, it doesn't work. I'm sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to explain that and I'm going to say it does work, but I'm going to show you how I, I interpret that. But I tried to pray through those times when I couldn't sleep. It doesn't work. At least for me. Okay, this is my experience. When I sit there and go, Lord, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I don't know how many people have anxiety have tried to press through with prayer and do that, but it doesn't always just work like that. I never had any of that before I went to Africa. One of the other traumatic things I had was when my son Nate had malaria and his, his liver shut down, his kidneys shut down. They didn't know if he was gonna make it, even through the night. And it's funny, I still remember when he's like, I'm sitting in the hospital. I stayed in the hospital for five days. And it, was, it was traumatic. And we went through that and, oh, by the way, in Mozambique, if you drive, you're gonna get pulled over. There's nobody behind you, they're always in the street. To this day, if I see somebody in the street in front of me, I went to Walmart the first night we came down here, I think it was, uh, I don't know, uh, Thursday night, whenever we came down here. I go to Walmart and there's a guy with a, a vest that reflects on it. He's surveying the street because we don't have cops in the street that pull you over here. We, we just don't have that. I mean, maybe some drunk, drunk driving place or something. I see the guy with a reflector on the way to Walmart in Laguna Niguel. And a panic just hit my heart. And it's not even rational. It's subconscious that that guy in the street is trouble. I have been harassed by so many policemen. I was harassed at least one time a week by a government official or a policeman while I was in Mozambique for nine years. That means hundreds of times I've been harassed. When I see somebody in the street, when we were in Thailand, the same thing happened. I see somebody in the street, like a policeman or something, and just instant panic goes into my heart. It's, it's, it's an amazing, weird, chemical thing. It doesn't even make sense. And it's subconscious. So I Googled this, this is really funny. I Googled, how much stronger is subconscious thoughts than regular thoughts? Google that. Google sh shoots up an answer 30,000 times more. Where did they get that? <laughs> Come on, not, not 10 times more, 100 times. 30,000 times more. Google, I Googled it. I don't know if that's true or not true. I, uh, uh, our ultimate source is not Google. So pretty smart that God's our ultimate source. So I say all that to say that I now experience anxiety that I never had before. I experience times when I see something and I just have an instant panic pain, which is weird. It's very short and I know it's probably nothing compared to people who have real, real serious anxiety problems beyond this thing. But, but the sleep and the other things that, that never happened until I went through serious events. And, and one thing it, it, it led me to, to say is that uh, I'm part of Planet Fitness uh, when I'm in Reading. And they have this big giant sign that says, Judgment Free Zone. I don't know if you've ever been to a Planet Fitness, if anybody's been there. They have all these signs, 
don't judge anybody. If they're wearing tights and a little, you know, muscle shirt or something, whatever they're wearing, or if they're overweight, you're not allowed to judge them. It is a judgment-free zone. I think the church should have that. Big up, big letters. Judgment-free zone. We don't get to judge anybody, you know? We're, 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 let's just get rid of judgment. And it actually helps at the gym. I see somebody, you know, and look at that guy, and I go, judgment-free zone? And, and it goes into my mind. And I want you to know that there are people that get anxiety and are anxious and it is not their fault they're not less spiritual than you some of it like me it's because of the events they've been through in their life you don't know what events people have been through if they've been uh, molested or if they've been uh, beaten or if they've had bad experiences some people just are raised chemically their brains just are more anxious than other people so it has taught me to have a lot of empathy and no judgment for anyone who suffers from anxiety. Now you might think, well, this morning you're talking about anxiety and, and Mozambique, and I don't really have that problem. Well, if you don't have that problem, fantastic. I want you to know one of the best ways to cure anxiety is to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about other people. And it is when you minister, I mean, now that you, if, if you take anything away from today's message as we talk about ways to overcome anxiety, use it for right now because if you're not anxious, there are people around you that are. There are people around you that are nervous and anxious and, and you might think, I don't know, I'm wearing a stupid mask, it doesn't even help, it's just dumb. I mean, but maybe that guy next to you might be a little anxious and worried and maybe we just, the response should be love rather than my right or whatever. <laughs> How can I help the people around me? In fact, um, we're going to find out in the scripture, the best way to overcome anxiety is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it actually is going to say that if I ever get that far because I'm talking so much in my time around right before anything else happens. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. It's a commandment. Don't, don't be anxious. Now it says, therefore, what is the therefore what is it therefore? You, you should always ask that. If there's a therefore, you should ask what it's there for. Well, the verse before that says you should not worship, you cannot serve both God and money. One of the biggest worries people have is money. One of the biggest worries now, as I look around here, you guys live in South Orange County, and some of you look like you might be at retirement age. I'm sorry, I'm just saying. <laughs> No judgment, judgment free not or anything. You're probably not as worried about money right now as others, okay? So you might need to take this. There's other things you're probably worried about, but that might not be it. You might be all set. You know, I don't know. Uh, everybody has different things. And I have found that the longer you live, the less you worry about money. I, I think. You know, I, I figure it at, I'm only 62. At 62, I am starting to figure out life. By the time I die, I will have figured out life. You know, they say that youth is wasted on the young, and I think it's true. I'm starting to figure out how things work and how I should be living my life, but I'm going to be dead pretty soon. This is not really a good turnover, but I'm starting to figure out how things work. And so I, I tell you that Lorena and I have not worried about money. We, we have gone on the mission field now three times where we have not really had anything committed and everything came in and we've always been provided for. So I say that, but there are a lot of people that you could minister to that are very concerned and their concerns are about money. You know, can I pay my bills? Do I have job security? Is my job gonna even come back? Uh, what will happen if I lose my job? What will happen if the economy crashes? There are a lot of people that are worried about that. And Jesus said, don't worry I always think of Bobby McFarland, the one that said, don't worry, be happy. But don't worry about your life. So you're not supposed to worry, but how do you not worry? And I was trying to sum up my life just to say, for me, it is no longer theoretical, but actually a part of my life. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor your body what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Yes. Look at the birds in the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Yes.
in order to not have anxiety, you have to have an understanding of who God is, right? He cares about you. Some people don't, some people don't get that. They can go their whole, their whole Christian life and not understand. God cares specifically about you. It is who you are. Kind of like that song, you know, that one that I think it says, like, uh, I'm loved by God. That's who I am. That's who I am. It's true. I am loved by God. Everyone here can say, I am loved by God. He cares about me. There may be 400 million Christians in the world. Uh, some statistics say there's two point something billion. I don't think that's true. But maybe 10, 20% of those people are actually really uh, born again believers. There may be hundreds of millions, but God loves every single one with a love that he would die for. Okay, so we need, and, and, and if we had time, we could go over dozens of scriptures that say how much God loves you. We should never forget the fact that God cares about me. He cares about birds. He cares a lot more about you. And so a lot of what we need to understand is who we are in order to overcome anxiety. In order to overcome anxiety, we need to understand that Jesus lives inside of us. He's with us. He's praying for us. Let me know that Jesus prays for us. If Jesus was sitting right here, and he was interceding for you about some worry you had, how worried would you be? Probably not at all. If Jesus was right there, I pray that when he goes and speaks it, at the Calvary Chapel down in San Juan Capistrano there, He's going to do good. I wouldn't worry about it. I look at Jesus sitting right there praying for me. Think about that in your life. Whenever you go through anything, Jesus is right there interceding for you. He loves you. He cares about you. And who we are is important. See, you are much more valuable than birds. Okay, that's like the, the probably one of the greatest understatements in all of human history that you're more important than birds. Now, I, I know birds are pretty important. I know that Having been in Africa, ostrich eyeballs are the largest eyeball of any land living creature. I mean, we can think about birds, and when we think about birds, we're not really supposed to think about the smallest bird in the world is the hummingbird that's two inches long. I mean, and you can fly backwards. We're not really supposed to be thinking about birds. We're supposed to be thinking about the fact that if he cares about birds, how much more? Uh, astronomically more. Um, so all of us, we need to always go into everything in the sense of identity. I am forgiven. I am loved. I am adopted by God. I am a child of God. I'm a child of the king that makes me a prince. Princesses, princes, all of you. I am going to be with God forever. I am with holy and part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm seated in the heavenlies. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds really good. You are currently seated in the heavenlies with Jesus. I don't know what it means, but it's got to be good. It's, it, I mean, this is all amazing, wonderful stuff. It's our identity, and we need to have our identity. When he says, are you not more valuable than birds? He's saying, you are valuable, and you need to understand that. And God is sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's sitting on the throne. He knows how to do everything well. He works everything together for good. Now, you're going through a lot of difficulties, but he's right there. And it changes our perspective when we understand who we are in Jesus Christ. This is all because of what Jesus did, not because I'm some fantastic person. I want you to know, I'll give you a little secret. Pastors, missionaries, teachers, evangelists, they are not super spiritual beings. They're just like everybody else. They still put their pants on one leg at a time. Well, I, I guess I could when I was young. Maybe I could have jumped and done it, but I... We're human. We're all human, which means we're all fallen, which means we all have faults, which means we're trying to get better, but we're not yet. And, and, and I think it's important to understand that, that it's not because we do great things that God loves us. It's because God loves us because he wants to. And he loves every single one, whether they were a pastor, a missionary, a housewife, anything, anywhere. 
probably the most difficult job was raising <laughs> five kids. I mean, for my wife. I mean, there are things that you think, wow, I've earned the right to be loved by God. So untrue. God loves you. It's his nature. It's who he is. And it's who you are to be loved by him. So God loves me. He's sovereign. He's in charge. Everything that happens, he's on my side. And so we're supposed to think about the birds of the air, which means that in order to overcome anxiety, we have to think. In fact, all of our problems of anxiety, besides the fact that they're chemical, are, are right here in the brain. Right here. It's that going over things. Now, some of our brains just naturally go there. Some of us just dismiss things that, that don't hurt us. But God knows us. He knows how to take care of us. He's there all the time. We were robbed, but no one was seriously injured when we were robbed at gunpoint and knife point. Nate didn't die in the hospital. When, he, when, I, when his breathing went from rough to shallow, I thought he died. But he didn't die. He's still alive. God's still his God, and God's still going to work in his life. I went to jail for eight hours. I didn't go for four days, and I didn't go for four years. <laughs> I went for eight hours, and God was there during that whole time. All the bad things that have happened to me or to you, God has always been there. He's always taken care of you, and he has always worked them together for good. So God says, don't be anxious about your life. Now the number one, if you go on any website, you can search what is the number one fear in the world, and it is COVID. I'm not worried about COVID. I have never have been. When I stay awake at night and I have to do certain things to get rid of the anxiety in my life, I have never sat there and worried about, I'm worried about COVID. Am I going to get sick? Am I going to die? See, the best thing that could happen is I could die. If you have that perspective, everything else is pretty much downhill. I just don't want to suffer in the process. <laughs> That's all I'm hearing about. If I want to go to heaven, just beat me up. I mean, we're into the rapture. I always thought of a nuclear bomb. I always want to be right in the center. I don't want to be in the outskirts where the radiation comes. I want to be right in the center. That would be just like a nuclear bomb is just like the rapture. If you're near the center police. None of us want to go through the suffering part of that. But that, if that's the worst that can happen, it has not worried me. It has bothered me that I can't still be in Asia. Okay? As, 